now we'll see what everyone has been thinking. And Jean Garrison will be our moderator. She is a former uh, Saturday University presenter. She is director of the International Studies Program at the International at the uh, University of Wyoming. Thank you very much, all of you, very much for the presentations. I just want to say that I'm very pleased to join my colleagues now and really open up this discussion to you. I am simply the moderator, and I could be clever and come up with things that connect a, a bunch of these presentations. I think. Caroline's presentation at the end really brought a lot of themes together. Um, and just want to say that um, this is really open to any questions you have, and uh, we're just really happy to um, kind of have more time for Q&A. So I just, that's what I would like to say to open it up. So the floor is open. My name is Carol Baker. My husband has lived here for a few years now. And I'm curious about where you get your funding for your research, each of you. In the presentation I gave, uh, that uh, research uh, has been funded by uh, the Na National Science Found Foundation, was uh, probably the primary, but um, some of the actual archaeological fieldwork that we did that recovered some of those radiocarbon dates uh, was also funded by the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, and those are, the, that's the, those are the two primary fund funding agencies. Yeah, my funding, the, the big chunk of it comes from the National Science Foundation, but we get smaller chunks from Wyoming Game and Fish, from Game and Fish departments throughout the country for applied stuff, and smaller things for expeditionary biology from National Geographic. And so I guess I would say I'm in the humanities. But there are some funding organizations, and so, so not specific to this project, but the American Council of Learned Societies will send people to conferences, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities um, will support uh, sabbatical research, but it tends to go in trends, so in recent years it's been very interested in biographies and archival work, and now it's interested in digital work, so the kind of work I've just been doing um, is not uh, particularly funded. Um, uh, there's uh, an institute in London called the Wellcome Institute uh, that has supported a fair amount of medical humanities, and I think it's the University of Texas down in Houston, um, Austin. and Galveston. Austin. Um, Austin. Austin. But they have a Galveston base, yeah, right? Um, does a lot. Um, but it's, in, it's a lot harder to get funded. On the other hand, we have access to wonderful libraries and archives that people have funded, and so our funding, I guess I would say, is indirect. We, we, um, depend on all the great work done by people um, places and pe people in places like this um, the preserve archives that we, that we can go and look at so we're, I'm not trying to make data I'm trying to find data <laughs> I mean I'm not trying to um, I don't need a lot of equipment but I really need libraries and access and that's the kind of thing that gets provided here yes sir speak about the barber pole a little bit <laughs> the significance of it with the early surgery. You know, the barber pole, I can't see you, and apparently you can't hear me, so I'm going to stand. Um, is, is, you know, that it's supposed to represent exactly that the barber is also the surgeon. Um, one interesting thing I discovered when I was in Edinburgh, and um, uh, I gave a talk um, related to this, and the, the, pro uh, the professor who works mostly in their anatomy museum came to, to see the talk, and then took me to, to see the, the talk. Uh, and, by the way, he was the, the professor of experimental anatomy, and I, I couldn't imagine what that was. Uh, but he said now we're sort of developing organs and growing organs. Um, but one of the things he told me, because I sort of uh, rather carelessly used a couple of terms, and he said, oh, no, no, um, that the uh, College of Surgeons at Edinburgh is very proud of its um, relationship to the barber surgeons, because the barber surgeons while, while they were looked down on as barbers, were surgeons and actually did do things as opposed to people who were making things up with potions and not testing anything. Um, and so barber surgeons were probably the, the best informed people about the human body before uh, surgery becomes um, uh, subject to sort of university kind of discipline. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. In my research in looking, they said that if you took um, carbon from a human being or even extracted carbon from an animal and you spun it really, really fast, just the carbon, that you could create a diamond out of that. Do you have any remarks on that? A high enough pressure. You just need uh, the hell of a lot of carbon. 
So it's not that you can make, you have to really compress things. You have to impose, you know, carbon is, is just, a, diamonds are just a form of crystallized carbon. So you could do that. Uh, I don't think we have the technology to do it, though. Thank you very much, because I'm having a wonderful time. Dr. <laughs> Kelly, what is, in your mind, what's the biggest mystery in Wyoming archaeology? Yeah. Or the biggest unanswered question? Yeah, we don't, I, I prefer to think that I don't deal with mysteries. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, unanswered questions, y y yes. Um, and, and those questions I don't think are unique to Wyoming archaeology. Uh, certainly, those are those certainly are the things that interest me. So I'm one of the things I've been dealing with recently is uh, the evolution of, of human human vi violence, and, and in particular war warfare. When when and why does that you know appear under the and, and so we know that it as I said in my talk we think that that the evidence for that is is fairly is fairly late. Um, and it looks like it appears when human population is actually at its highest uh, pre-contact uh, dens density. And, you know, that, that sort of makes sense. We kind of think that warfare appears when it's, it's competition over the basic resources of, 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 of life. And we're not entirely positive about that yet. We'd like to, I mean, that seems like common sense, but um, we always want to test those ideas because there was a point in time when we thought um, drawing blood out of people was a common sense way to, to solve a, a problem or, you know, leeches or something. Um, so, so we always want to test those ideas, even if they seem like they're, they're common sense. So what I'm, what I'm thinking about now is the, is the evolution of, of violence and what can Wyoming tell us, you know, as a case study, what can it, it tell us about the evolution of violence? Other questions? Um, yes, Dr. Kelly, I wonder if you can speak to the National Geographic Genome Project. I mean, I, I, I know about it, but I just wonder I want, if, if it might not fit in with, with your speaking of, of when people arrive where, et cetera. Well, I can, I, I can, sp I, I can speak to the genome in general. I, I think that the, there are Agassilian genome projects. Uh, one that I'm particularly fond of recently, and I will mention in a second. But um, I think that studying genomes, I, 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 we can now, it used to be very expensive to sequence genomes. It's becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So we can start getting genomes. And I think these genomes, the one you're referring in particular, will give us um, a very good idea of the movements of humans um, throughout the world. But there are some, a variety of other genomes. The genome is, I think, we are. At, uh, we were discussing. Bob and I were discussing how different the stages of our fields are, and um, how archaeology has gone over its period of uh, expeditionary biology, expeditionary archaeology. You don't go to big expeditions. In biology, we're doing exactly that. We're doing expeditionary bi biology, but we are not going to remote places. We're going inside of the nuclei of cells and looking at genomes. And finding this, um, Darwin used to speak of the tangle bank uh, as an ecological tangle bank. What we're finding is that genomes are tangle bank, banks of genes, and we don't know exactly how they become expressed in, in, our, in our organisms. So I, it's a very exciting part of, of biology now, is, is learning what these genomes are doing. And they will tell us all sorts of things about our, our history, our, uh, even our cultural history. I, I think the genome era is incredibly, incredibly interesting. Let me just mention one thing that I'm very interesting about, interested about, which is that we are now talking a lot about our own genome. One of the things that we have discovered in, in, in the last 15 or 20 years is that we don't have a single genome. All of us in this room, uh, in this room are a conglomerate of genomes. Let me give you a few factoids that are quite remarkable. The number of, uh, and I'm sorry, this is a launch thing, but uh, the number of bacteria in your large intestine, the number of bacterial cells is about 10 times larger than the number of cells in your own body. The number of genes in the cells in your uh, large intestine is about 100 times higher 
than uh, the number of genes that you have in your own genome. And we have just learned how to study bacteria. So when we talk about genomes, uh, suddenly we have realized that we are this conglomerate. I'm sorry to inform you guys, but we are mostly bacteria. If you were to dissolve your body, <laughs> if for some magical body snatching thing, we were to dissolve your bodies, we could still kind of recognize that you are human by the imprint of little bacterial bodies floating around. Uh, and so the next step looking at genomes is thinking about the multigenomic human, which is, I think, a very exciting thing. Is there a question over here? Um, this is for Dr. Kelly. My name is Crystal, and I was curious with the Greenland ice cap and how they would measure the amount of volcanic ash in the atmosphere to relate to climate change. And I know that's one example, but I don't understand how we could gather global climate change just from one piece of the northern hemisphere. And I understand that why they chose the Greenland ice cap, but how does that correlate to the whole globe? Maybe Peter, do you have a better answer? <laughs> well, I can tell you the way to do it is you drill a hollow core into the ice cap, uh -huh. and you pull out the ice. And when you look at the ice, you can actually see layers of volcanic ash every once in a while. But then they measure chemically the content, for example, of sulfate and many other chemicals in every layer of the right. ice. And they can date every layer quite precisely. But would that so be that you, have a, you have a history book. <clears throat> but specifically for that location, I mean, if I go to Antarctica and pull an ice core sample, it's going to be completely different, right? right. No, no, not or necessarily. What, 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 they, what they look in the ice core is that those things which do get spread around the atmosphere um, pretty, pretty thor thoroughly. And, and they've been able to um, demonstrate that this happens by looking at um, the, the above ground uh, atomic uh, tests that took place in the you know, 1940s and, 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 and 50s. And putting up stations around the, the world, they, you can see that that radioactive uh, emissions they're spread all over the world within uh, probably a couple of couple of years. I mean, very very quickly. Uh, so so the the things that they're looking at are those things that do get spread around the world through the through the atmosphere pretty pretty thoroughly. Atmospheric circulation basically moves from the equator to the poles. Right. And so volcanic eruptions near the equator or in the northern hemisphere are very well recorded in Greenland. Greenland is also very close to Iceland, and a lot of the volcanism in the last uh, 100,000 years has been from Iceland. So. Thank you. I had a question about what you just were talking about, not to um, delve into non-lunchtime conversation, but all of those bacteria to which you just referred, are those bacteria that I carry with me as a, as a basis of my um, genetic heritage and or where I've lived and water I've consumed <coughs> and a combination of that and what I've eaten or is it purely what I've eaten or is it purely what I carry with me genetically? One of the things that we have learned is that there's an enormous diversity in taxonomy. We have tropical rainforests in terms of, of diversity of species. However, they differ very little in, genemic, in gen genomic expression. So, uh, let me give one example of Carolyn and I probably share less than 5% of species of bacteria. But the same, gene, the same genes are expressed very commonly. But there are differences among ethnic groups. For example, the Japanese have a remarkable gene uh, to digest nori. <laughs> and it's only, only the bacteria. And we're just beginning to know what these bacteria do. It's a, it's a very exciting thing, I think. <laughs> Another question. Jacqueline. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, um, do you uh, work on your own, or do you have like, a team? Like Everyone else seems like they work with team and other scientists. Yeah. Do, do you do all your research on your own? Humanities are, are interesting because we do an awful lot of work on our own. Right? We sort of uh, come up with interests, dive into libraries. <laughs> but then remember that, as I said before, we're dependent on uh, not just the goodwill, but the hard work of archivists and librarians and collectors and so on. 
But increasingly, this is something that people do together. So uh, even the work that I've been doing, where my work um, tends to bounce off and critique, uh, um, there's a whole range of popular histories of Jekyll and Hyde. And I'm interested in the telling of the story, right? So that's all data for me. Um, but those, it's all, also source material that I then go and, go and check. And so when, when you're um, working on a project like this, I found myself also dealing with lots of doctors and, and having them point me in the direction of various things. Uh, and um, uh, the work that I do is, is, as I said before, going to be used by all kinds of, of people and possibly even, you know, here, here's, you know, whenever you write a book, there's always some little paragraph that says, and film rights. And I always look at that little line and say, say if only, you know, but uh, <laughs> who knows, Jack and I, next iteration. John, John, there's a, a woman who recently wrote a, a history, a really very good history, um, and uh, 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 we have conversations about if John Landis had only consulted us, it would be so much better. Uh, but that's not going to happen, because the story is out in popular culture, right, so it's a, it's a big deal. Um, uh, but more and more, I think people do work together. Um, but the, but the sitting down to write a book is often a solitary pursuit. But you, you really are dependent on lots of other people's work, just, just as um, you know, all scientists are dependent on people before them and, and giving something on as well. But it's a slightly different model, the humanities. Um, uh, collaborative, but in different ways. But also changing, and I think particularly where, um, uh, for instance, literary study does move on toward, or, or moved a little bit towards uh, social science questions, or. Um, uh, scientific questions or whatever, then you really are dependent on other people or, or you're going toward a different model. And so um, at the parts of literary study, for instance, where we have people working in gender and women's studies, uh, um, African-American studies, et cetera, um, those tend to be very collaborative. Uh, so so it's, a, it's interesting. I, I think academia is actually shifting a little bit. And I have a colleague who's working on digital humanities, and she says that all knowledge now is a shared project, uh, that, so that you might not like what you see in Wikipedia, but somebody's sharing it with you, you know, and that all we used to think of writing and reading as separate activities, and now they go on almost instantaneously together, and knowledge is getting reworked as you produce it, and that's something that's, that we will be both participating in um, and analyzing, I think. So, so it's a great question. I think we're probably at the moment where uh, whatever people want their, their form of study to be, it is, it is going to be um, much more expansive and much more collaborative. Mm -hmm. A bit of a follow-up on that, you were mentioning that there's, um, you're sort of in part of the new field of, of humanities and the medical profession, and so showing how the social perspective and the science and medicine have sort of co-evolved, so to speak. Is some of the work that you're doing, is that reflecting back on the medical profession? You're obviously reflecting a lot of what the Mm -hmm. profession is doing for, for the humanities, but I didn't know if your humanities are going back in any of the teaching hospitals or how mm -hmm. people are looking at the ethics of medicine and that sort of thing. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer. Uh, you know, medical humanities isn't brand new. There have actually been people, some of them trained in medicine, um, uh, doing it. People like Roy, Roy Porter we were just talking about. Um, and there are lots of you know, popular, uh, you put up uh, the, the book Stiff, right, which um, sometimes from a reportorial, sometimes from a medical perspective, uh, these, these fields getting intertwined. But um, in terms of, of what we give back, I think it really, uh, one of the things that got me into this is I'm very, very interested in how um, we, we tell stories to manage certain circumstances. Uh, and I used to look at how um, 19th century Scotland starts telling stories, and sort of invent the kilted Highlander. And it becomes a very popular figure, and it becomes a representative figure of Scotland. And it's so representative, it looks entertaining and harmless. And bingo, you got a parliament, right? Uh, just a few years ago, if you tell the right story. Um, the story that I've been looking at, though, is how to manage a really dark story, and how uh, people keep trying to retell it, and retell it, and get it to come out differently, or to, or to somehow um, uh, integrate it and move on. I think it was this one was a particularly traumatic one. And so as a part of my research, I ended up at the Office of Human Research Protections Conference, right? The people who uh, help uh, scholars, particularly in, in medicine, but in a lot of sciences, 
uh, negotiate their relationship with their patients, and, and particularly you know, what are the laws, what are the protocols, what are the internal review boards, et cetera, that you have got to attend to when you are practicing medicine in particular or using any human subject? What kind of agreements do you have to have? And that was, to me, fascinating. And, and here's the point of contact. Um, uh, I was fascinated because it was so much a discussion about, even with the best will in the world, and, and you know, clearly a necessary discussion, and those are all good things to have, you know, laws and procedures and protocols. But it was so much about laws and procedures and protocols, it, it forgot about sort of the interface um, with, with the actual people you're dealing with. It forgets about um, uh, the stories that get told. And one of the things that becomes very, very evident in the story of Jacqueline Hyde, or, or of Dr. Knox, is that at that moment, and there's a fair amount of theory about this now too, at, that mo at the moment things went horribly wrong, had Dr. Knox done what Walter Scott said, which is, just explain. Ex say you thought it was a terrible, terrible thing. You're really sorry your science you know, produced this. You're ho horribly embarrassed to be implicated. You feel terrible for the families. If at that point in any kind of medical um, pro uh, you know, malpractice of whatever, you, s you simply apologize, then it's a much more manageable situation. And when you don't apologize, <coughs> then the story is anybody's, and they will tell it. And so science, even really good science, and the science that Knox was producing was good science, but it was horrible practice. And so the science then gets really undermined because things become scandalous. And once it's a scandal, it's out of the box, all kinds of stories get told. And so if I were thinking about what comes back to, in particular, medicine from the kind of work that I, I do or other people have been doing, it's, it's to think really hard about the interface with the patient, with the interface with the culture. Think about how to explain what you're doing and not just in terms of the science. You know, think, think about how to explain um, something like stem cells in, in terms of what stem cells can do for people um, uh, in, instead of uh, the, the many problems that arise in terms of, of where they might come from. You know, just think, of, think about how you, what people are hearing and what, what story is both accurate, fair, and honest to tell. Yes. What I find really interesting in that story is the difficulty of Stevenson <coughs> publishing The Body Snatchers versus uh, Jekyll and Hyde. And in many ways, they're both about good and evil. But Jekyll and Hyde is impersonal. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a magic potion. It's something which is not what we deal with in everyday life. In the case of the body snatchers, one could argue that Dr. Knox and his purveyors and others were trying to do the best job. That from Knox's point of view, he was trying to advance medicine, and maybe his purveyors got a little ahead. Anyway, we all make decisions every day in life as to how far to push the ethical margin yep. in business and in medicine and every in every field. And so, when you have a story that's that close to our lives, that is something that that makes good and evil real rather than heaven and hell or something that's impersonal, um, then you have trouble publishing it. I find that very interesting. Yeah, and, and I think I would also say on that one that um, Jekyll and Hyde, the, the history of its telling, is very informative there because it gets told you know, every, I'm going to say 10 years, but that's way underestimating, and, but it always gets told in a way that reflects the moment of its retelling. And so it's very frequently, you know, in the, in the 1920s in America, it's a story about prohibition. In the 1940s, it's a story about what's, whether it's ever appropriate to intervene in anything. So it's very much America um, at, the, at the brink of war. In the 1970s, it's about drug culture and about gender. And uh, um, so, so it's a story that people can read themselves into and read differently, right? And, and according to their present moment definition of, 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 of good and evil. Um, but the body snatcher is very specific. It's this moment, this thing, this problem, this set of ethical choices. So, so there it's, it's more about the choice and much more personal um, than Jekyll and Hyde is read as, as, as being. And so in that respect, Stevenson was pretty successfully stealthy, although in terms of telling the story perhaps too successfully stealthy. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Carlos, you done a research in a lot of different areas. Is there a particular area of research that you haven't been able to get to yet that particularly compels you? Yeah, this microgenome thing. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I really want to get into this kind of stuff. <laughs> so. <laughs> that was an easy one to answer. Yeah. Well, other questions? I know I have one to post to everybody to kind of link everything back together, but I'd prefer to take one from the audience before I post this one. And, and maybe, this is the, maybe this is kind of the last question. And so what I'm struck by from Saturday University as a participant, but also now as a moderator of a panel like this, is that this actually gives us from the UW a real opportunity to talk to each other across our disciplines. <coughs> and I think that uh, often when these programs are put together, they're really, they're not necessarily put together with an obvious theme, but it seems to me that it's the discussion itself with you guys here uh, and wherever we do uh, Saturday University and activities like this, it's amazing the connections that we start drawing ourselves across these various talks in, in our fields. I'm the social scientist in, amongst this group, but uh, so I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the things that, that have been said. And, and also the questions also seem to have kind of brought together themes. They were questions from more than one person, and not just the two scientists, supposedly. So this is the question that I'm posing to you. Having been here, having pre prepared your talk, but then having given it here in this venue, having heard this, and then we flew up on a plane together, so we had an opportunity. So I wondered if you would want to reflect upon your talk and your thinking on your own project vis-a-vis -vis others, or vis-a-vis -vis the conversation that you've had today. And maybe I would start with Bob, since Bob is, uh, Bob, you've been more quiet than others. <laughs> and archaeology, after all, cultural archaeology and physical archaeology, uh, and anthropology, if anything, is the middle ground that brings, that really does bridge uh, this panel. So maybe Bob, if you, this, this is a comment, this is a final thought comment too. Um. It could also be about where your work is going. So there's any number of things. Well. If anyone in academia, whether you're in the sciences, whether you're in the humanities, to 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 do any task right, you have to you have to focus on it, and you have to shut other things out, because otherwise you find yourself going, oh, that's interesting, and oh, that's interesting, yeah. and that's that's it. because there are lots of interesting things out there in the in the world, but you'll end up not getting anything done. So, so you do have to say, okay, for the moment, I'm going to shut everything out and I'm going to focus on this problem. So I go in my office and I've got radiocarbon dates and I've got mathematical formula and I've got to figure out, is this the right way to do this? But, and, and, and you're kind of like, don't bother me about anything else, right? Because I've got this problem right here to work on. And, and that's, that's a necessary thing to do. You, you've got to be focused. But it's also necessary that you step back every once in a while and stop thinking about that that one little little thing and look at the broader world and look at what what does the broader world think about what you're you're doing and uh, uh, that may make you think about is is this what I should be doing not 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 whether what I've done is wrong I mean that can happen someone can tell me oh you, there's a mistake in your calculation there and that's 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 useful but but also whether is this is this where I should be spending my time at the at the moment is this the most important thing I could be doing um, uh, in in terms in, in thinking about what my field can bring to the rest of humanity um, and and in order to do that I find that as a scientist I really have to step back and really be a, 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 a humanist to, th to think about whether what I'm doing is, is the important way to use my time. I, I, I write uh, introductory textbooks, introductory freshman level uh, textbooks for my, my field, uh, archaeology. And those are, those are they're, they're, very, they're much more difficult to write than you might, than you might think. Um, mostly because you have to think about what you're not going to put in the, in the text, textbook. But, but they're a very interesting enterprise because you have to think about what's, the f what's going to be the foundation of my field. Because somebody could pick up this book and read it and say, I'm going to become an archaeologist. And, and that book is going to create the foundation that they're going to build their, their, their career on. 
So what's, I have to think about, what, what do I want you know, the student's foundation to be in my field? One of the things I've, I've said in my textbooks is that uh, um, a good archaeologist has a, a, a scientist in his or her hands and a, a humanist in their, in their, in their heart. And that's, that's the way I find we have to, we, we ought to be thinking. And you have to go back and forth between the, the two, of, two of those. And it's, it's coming out here and talking to the, the public, uh, which is where I most, I'm able to go back and re reflect on, whether, is, this, is this how I should be spending my time? Is this the most important thing I can be doing, um, you know, given my knowledge and my, my capa capa capabilities? So, that's my answer to the question. That was a very good start to the answer. I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering what space we've left for Carlos. Oh, very small. <laughs> but, you know, Elisa, Elisa's a very young person with absolutely awful intellectual attention deficit disorder. Uh, I read a, 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 an essay by C.P. Snow where he described the two worlds, and he said that the scientists didn't know how to talk with the humanities, and the humanities were inter not interested in talking with us with the sciences, and that, uh, worse, um, we were not particularly keen on doing so. And I think that this kind of uh, venue um, is very useful because it, uh, um, let me tell you, I, I'm not trying to um, flatter, flatter you, but I think that you are the kind of people that I would like to graduate from the University of Wyoming. I, I would like scientists that know something about Walter Scott, and that know quite a lot about Robert Louis Stevenson, and that can take a text and put it in a historical context. Uh, but I would also like, and this is sometimes difficult as well, I would like people in the humanities that are interested in neutrons in quarks. And uh, that, that seems to be the, 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 the basic idea behind a liberal arts education. And, um, and there's something we cannot abandon. You guys are, to me, a very inspiring example of people that are as enthusiastic about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, as about uh, the intricacies of a model to predict global change. And so, for me as an educator, this is very inspiring. The University of Wyoming is going through a very interesting phase. We are, I think, we are changing it. We, we are rethinking it. And one of the things that I, I would like to see is truly the persistence of this liberal arts idea that is embodied in this group. So, thank you, it was a great experience. And I think there's even less space left, but there's a great segue. Um, I would say all the things that uh, Bob and Carlos have already said, but I would also pick up on the last thing you said, which is the university is, is changing. And that's fascinating to me because, you know, I'm in a field where um, we tend to look at texts from the past and sometimes forget that what we're doing is actually very, very much of the present and the future, particularly the kinds of questions you've been asking me is about how does this apply back? How, what, what happens to medicine when you bring this kind of awareness to it, for instance? And one of the things that we've been talking about at the university is, is exactly the kind of collaborations that we're talking about here, even though I said we're not, we don't do them primarily in, in the humanities. But one of the current initiatives is to think, rethink the humanities alongside um, the sciences at the university and particularly, um, the president said, humanity is appropriate to the state of Wyoming. And you think, what could that possibly mean? But what is beginning to look more and more as if it means is um, understanding the ways in which sciences, humanities, social sciences collaborate to understand major problems. And so remember I said we like to look at texts and humanities, but that's where we start, not where we finish. And so moving out into the really bigger questions, particularly for um, you were talking about freshman study and how, how our work changes when we're trying to bring somebody into a field, but then how, when you're trying to change a field, when you're trying to really develop and, and spread beyond the boundaries and show how fully applicable something is, um, then you're looking at, at doctoral level study and what kinds of people you think are going to be leaders when, when we're all gone <laughs> and, and we're quite senior scholars now, which is chastening to realize. Um, but it's going to be something different, and still humanities, but humanities informed by all sorts of things, and science informed by humanities, and social sciences informed um, in different ways. So, so things are changing, and, and it is actually these kinds of conversations are not just between faculty, but between faculty and people in the state, and people from all over that are really informative in trying to think 
about where knowledge is going and where we want it to go and where it's going to have to develop to be something that um, really energizes uh, our children and, and, the, and the future in, in ways that you know we will not be here to participate in, but that we can begin to project. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is, this is a, a huge privilege to be here and talk to you all and, and hear what you're thinking about the humanities. So thank you. Um, so I have one final thought and then uh, just a couple of thank yous. And that is that you know universities are living organisms and they should be seen as such. They are both, uh, we, I think those of us in the academy both uh, reflect the change. Our students certainly bring in change. And if you've taught for any length of time, you really do see differences. But we're also what we hold on to. We hold on to values and, and bases of knowledge that, that we use in our own societies. And so, you know, as a living organism, uh, I think of it, the University of Wyoming this way very personally because I am both a graduate of the University of Wyoming and I came back to be a faculty member. And I do have that kind of within my own lifespan, that memory of being a student actually in international studies and now I'm directing that particular program. And so it's kind of a unique experience to see that and, and so the debates keep coming around and it's an exciting time to be at the University of Wyoming. Uh, it's an exciting time to actually be a citizen of the state of Wyoming and I would just that's the last thought I have because they left us with really, I think, the appropriate point, and that is, uh, please help me thank our three experts from the University of Wyoming, and with that, of course, is to thank you and all of UW's partners up here in Jackson to make Saturday University here in October um, a success. Thank you.